Good day, everyone. I'm your host, Lee Judge, and welcome to today's webinar entitled Visualize Your Cisco IVR Delight Your Mobile Customers, brought to you by Jakarta. As a note, to honor the privacy of our attendees, only your name will appear in the attendee window. Our presenter today is Chris Dutoy, Executive Director of Product Marketing at Jakarta. Today we will look at how Visual IVR connects easily to your existing Cisco Unified Customer Voice Portal, as well as how to preserve your existing IVR investment, and more on how Visual IVR can be leveraged on the mobile channel for superior customer experience. Following the presentation, there will be a question and answer session, so please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A window at any time. Also, as a note, once again, to honor the privacy of our attendees, only your name will appear in the attendee window. So let's begin. The presentation is all yours, Chris. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lee, uh, for that introduction. And good morning and good afternoon to everyone on our webinar today, Visual IVR for Cisco. Um, we, we did have a webinar this morning with a few audio problems. If you have troubles uh, hearing me, please just send a, a note to Lee, who will try and address that. Um, and we do have a mixed audience on, on the webinar today, uh, you know, some mix between business and technical. So, so the presentation is going to cover both. Uh, we will show a little bit of technical architecture diagrams for, for the people familiar with Cisco who are on the call. But if you need more technical information, by all means, just contact us following this webinar, and we'd be happy to send you documentation or uh, in, any detailed architecture diagrams and so forth. So, so with that, let's get started. I'm, I'm very excited to be talking not only about the concept of visual IVR, but also how this works within your Cisco environment. And you know, a really natural and good place to start with this is to, to look at why the IVR is still a strategic asset to your organization. And, and the reason I'm starting here is because it's very easy to start getting the impression that the IVR is kind of on the way out, that it's some legacy instrument and it's, and, and, you know, it's dying within the organization. And you know, we, we hear about social media as the new form of self-service or customer service or speaking avatars and web self-service. And, and, and there's all this innovation um, and, and it starts making you think, well, is the IVR on the way out? And emphatically, the answer there is absolutely not. And I'm pretty sure he wasn't referring to the IVR when he said this, but you know, the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. And to understand why your IVR is still a strategic asset to your organization, it really helps just to step back for a second and look at how your customers are contacting you today. Now, these numbers are across a range of industries and verticals. So, so your numbers, you know, if you're in the banking sector or vertical, you probably have slightly better numbers, uh, whereas some industries might have slightly worse numbers. But by and large, these numbers are representative of, of, of the customer experience or customer service industry as a whole. So 60% of your customers are attempting self-service today. And I certainly fall into that camp. And my suspicion is that most of us on this webinar are in that camp as well. If we're going to try and do self-service before we pick up the phone and call you. And here is kind of what's the surprising thing is, you know, only about 30% of those people are self-servicing successfully. Um, the rest of us are running into issues where our situation is too complicated and the user experience just breaks down and, and we, we struggle in our self-service session and we abandon. And in fact, around 70% of us abandon that self-service session. Um, and, and what do they do? When you abandon the self-service session, you're going to pick up the phone and reach out into an assisted service session, and you're going to phone. Um, and of course, you're going to hit the IVR. The other 40% of your customers, they're not even trying self-service. They're just going to pick up the phone and call you directly. And of course, today, most of those are calling from a, from a smart device, an iPhone or an Android device. Um, but the net result is those 40%, they have the bill in front of them. They're, they're, they're disputing the bill. There's a 1-800 number on the top of the bill. They're just going to phone you directly. They're not even going to go to the web self-service site. So why am I saying all of that? The net result is that around 82% of your customer interactions are still ending up in the contact center. So despite all that investment in web self-service and, and speaking avatars and social media, you still have roughly 82% of your customer interactions ending up here in the contact center. And that should give you a sense 
of why the IVR, your, 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 your Cisco voice IVR is so critical to the organization and remains a fundamental part of, of any customer service strategy. And in fact, it's not just that the IVR is not in a state of demise, um, it's actually an exciting time to be in the IVR world again. We're seeing great innovation within the IVR world and Cisco obviously leading that innovation and, and coming up with some tremendous uh, innovations in, in, in the IVR sort of space, if you will, leaps and bounds in technology and speech, adaptive and personalized menus that, that understand the context and, and, and understand why you're calling, a lot of standardization around voice XML. It's just really a great time to, to be involved in the IVR industry again because of the innovation that we're seeing with the realization of how critical it is to your organization and companies like Cisco who are really pioneering and pushing the edge of what is possible with these IVRs. So it's just a really great time to, to, to be in that IVR space. And, you know, there, there might be some question on the call, you know, the, the, the webinar is entitled Visual IVR. So the question, you know, are we saying that speech or voice IVRs are going away? Um, and that's an emphatic no, absolutely not. I showed you how critical that IVR is, that it's handling 82% of your customer interactions today. So it's not going anywhere. Um, However, there should be little doubt that the world is really moving to touch and visual. Uh, it's, it's a new demographic of people growing up uh, that, that want to interact in a different way. And, you know, look, we, we're, we're all humans. Um, we like to speak. We like to speak to each other. Um, but when it comes to talking to a machine, it really just doesn't feel natural. Um, there's, a, there's a certain reluctance for us, for many of us, to talk to a computer. Uh, and so, so touch is really the new form of human interaction. And, and we can thank the iPhone or, or Apple for bringing touch into the mainstream. You know, we've had touch systems for a long time. For example, point of sale systems in, in stores and restaurants. But it was really the iPhone that brought touch, and not just touch, but gestures uh, into the mainstream where we all started interacting with our machines through a touch mechanism by swiping and tapping and scrolling, et cetera. And uh, the, the great thing about this, it was very intuitive. There was no learning curve. It was just very, very natural. Um, and it was very, very precise, which is the most important part. It's very precise. You know, I don't know when last you've had your iPhone say something like, I'm sorry, I did not understand that. Can you please touch me again? You know, yet we hear that all the time, of course, on certain other channels. You know, touch is just very, very accurate. Um, and it's just how we expect to interact with machines at this point. You've probably seen these YouTube viral videos of where a baby or a toddler walks up to the TV screen and they're swiping the TV screen expecting to change the channel. Again, it's touch input. And, and that's not just for people on their mobile phone. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you recall just a few years ago, all the car companies that were advertising how you could, you know, change the channel in your car by speaking to it. and, and using speech recognition, and honestly, it was less than successful. It, it wasn't really adopted well by consumers, uh, you know, problems with accents or background noise or whatever the case might be. Um, it, it honestly never really evolved past the phase of being a novelty. But now you look at the state-of-the-art cars like the Tesla Model S, and what did they do? They, they, they understood this, and the entire center console of that car is one large, what looks almost like an iPad, uh, which is touch, touch control. So they, they are using touch to control it, just, again, just because touch is a very intuitive and accurate form of human-machine interaction. And, you know, for those on the, on the webinar, you might be feeling intuitive. What I'm saying makes sense. You kind of agree with it. Um, but these numbers also backed up. You know, in, in any study you really do, you're going to find similar results. In, in this study, we can see just in four years what a remarkable shift it's been from using the home telephone uh, up to using you know, your mobile phone for self-service. Uh, and really, you look at these last bottom four categories, they're all related to the mobile phone, whether it's using your phone to speak to somebody, browsing a website, text messaging, or, or using your mobile phone for self-service there's no doubt that the customer interaction preferences really are changing rapidly, and, and any study will bear this out, including just our own gut feeling and our day-to-day -day usage of, of what we do day-to-day. -day. Chances are you're spending a lot of time on that smart device. So with all that said, you know, it's, 
It's just a little unfortunate that as strategic as the IVR is, as we started this presentation, it just doesn't lend itself very well to the touch experience. And so what we're saying is, why not visualize the IVR experience? Uh, and, and take those existing Cisco IVR menus that you already have in your voice portal IVR and, and just make them visually accessible on mobiles, tablets, computers, and devices um, so that you can really just extend what Cisco is offering um, in terms of the voice IVR and extend that out. And when you do that, customers can now see and touch. You know, there's that word again. They can touch their way through the menu by just looking at it on their smartphone. And here's what a typical visual IVR solution might look like just pictorially, and I'll be showing you the actual product uh, a little bit later on. But here's kind of what it looks like. You would literally navigate through visual touching of your voice IVR trees. And in, in this conceptual example, the users click to support, then they click part replacement, and then they connect to an agent who has all that information on their screen, and they know everything that you've already done. So it truly is a visual representation of your voice IVR. It's not a replacement to voice IVR. It's reusing your Cisco IVR and just producing that visual interface on top of it. And I think what's interesting, you know, we just naturally think, when we think of IVRs, we, we gravitate towards the phone because that, that's how we typically interact with an IVR. But what's really interesting about the visual experience or visual version of your IVR is that you can actually embed it on your website. And for example, instead of just, you know, boldly displaying a 1-800 number on your website, you can put it behind your contact us button. So here when a user reaches out and they touch the contact us button, instead of just, you know, going straight into a phone call, you can start the visual IVR navigation right then and there. So you start navigating your IVR tree on the website before connecting you to an agent. Um, what you can do, of course, as well, is start embellishing and extending these flows. And here's a great example of doing something which is only available in the visual channel, not in the voice channel. In this example, somebody is ordering a replacement part, um, and in to do so under warranty, they have to enter the service tag that's on the bottom of their laptop. Now, if you tried entering alphanumeric data like this on touch tone, one through nine, it would be practically impossible. So here's a great example of where you can add additional information which you can collect before connecting the person to the contact center. And this is a big ROI driver. If you're looking for the business justification here, it's actually quite easy because by me just collecting the service tag ID before connecting you to the agent, you free up the agent from having to ask you this information where you have to put them on hold and then go lift up your laptop and look for the service tag. So you save at least 30 to 60 seconds of average handle time by enriching what you collect up front. Um, and then ultimately you can allow them to place the call uh, and you can also connect into the Cisco, you know, through Social Miner, for example, display the current waiting times and offer to give a callback option as well. So all of that is possible on visual. Now, I, I do want to stress that you can do a one-for-one -one mapping with your Cisco IVR. So you can take your, your, your voice IVR and just map it one-for-one -one as a visual session. You know, in this example of enriching it by collecting alphanumeric data, that's certainly optional and often is a phase two. So, you know, maybe a phase one approach is just get a visual version of your IVR, test out your customer adoption, and then slowly expand it and enrich it over time. Uh, but certainly that, that is available to you to do. So, you know, in, in concluding in terms of why visual, I, I think it should be intuitive to most on this call that it, that, it, that it does sound right. You know, intuitively we feel like we want to use mobile and web. Um, and, and plus, look, it's, it's a lot faster scanning a smartphone screen. I, I can look through my menu options just by glancing at the screen versus listening to a long sequential list of voice instructions. Um, and, and the result of this is what we call less zero outs in the industry because if I choose the wrong menu option, I can easily see that I'm in the wrong tree and hit the back button and go you know, up to the previous level and choose the right option, where on the voice IVR, typically you're going to have a frustrated consumer and they're going to hit zero just to speak to an agent. Uh, and the cost behind that, of course, is now you reach the wrong agent group, you explain your entire problem, only to be told by the agent that they have to transfer you to a different group. So, uh, you know, we, we see significantly less zero outs by actually going into this kind of visual approach. 
And, and here's the good news. Uh, speech and visual are entirely complementary. Uh, you know, I hope that I've imparted the fact that it really is working with your Cisco IVR to take your existing IVR script and project that visually. Um, and, and really the way I like to think of it is to say it's an extension to your Cisco IVR. You're really taking that, that investment uh, in, in the Cisco IVR, which is you know, serving the organization fantastically, uh, and just exposing it out to some additional channels. So you're ensuring that the newer kind of visual smartphone generation have a channel that they may prefer interacting with your IVR, um, and, and just leveraging and, and extending that Cisco IVR not just to the mobile devices, but also to your website, um, and or even set-top boxes or kiosks or wherever else you want to put a footprint. So certainly a lot of options. So it, it, it isn't an either-or approach. It's, it's a concept of taking taking your Cisco IVR and just giving it a larger footprint within the organization to expose it to more of your customers. And so, you know, if you want to look at just conceptually how does it work, uh, this is a, a, a diagram that really shows very easily what happens. Uh, in the middle, visual IVR is depicted here kind of by this green eye icon. Um, and, and what happens is it's, it's connected to your Cisco IVR, and it's reading the VXML or the voice XML, you know, the output from your Cisco voice portal server, uh, and it's taking that, and in real time, it's projecting it and converting it to an HTML-based interface so that you can now use it on your website or in a mobile app or, or you know, in a kiosk or set-top box. Um, but it is a real-time conversion, so when you make changes here in Cisco, it, it's automatically reflected in the visual IVR as well. So you're not rewriting a new set of interactions or, or, or rewriting your back-end integrations, et cetera. It is a reuse of your Cisco IVR. Uh, and then ultimately, of course, you can provide that rich screen pop to the agent so that the agent understands and sees everything your customer did uh, in that visual IVR session prior to connecting. Um, including, you know, if you entered alphanumeric data and, and what data you entered and so forth to, to shorten that call time. Um, you know, just a, a slightly more technical but still really a market texture diagram, but for the Cisco, uh, you know, people familiar with Cisco who are on the call today, uh, you can see here, for example, um, where you're using Call Studio and you, and you create your IVR interactions um, and, and they're really being rendered as VXML by the voice portal server. Uh, and, and you have your standard voice gateway connecting to that. Where Visual IVR fits in is really sitting side by side and connecting to that VXML server through a standard connection. Uh, and, and once that connection is made, we can then take your, your IVR interactions and project that uh, to a browser um, or, or mobile app. So really it's just sitting side by side uh, with your existing Cisco infrastructure and, and reading what that Cisco infrastructure is, is doing. Uh, you know, and I mentioned earlier, you know, you can, for example, on the mobile phone, you can display, uh, you know, hold times, uh, give the option, give the user an option for a callback. Um, and, and certainly we've seen some great integration here, for example, with Social Miner from Cisco and, and a big thanks to, to our, uh, the, the Cisco EMEA team for their assistance in this. Uh, you know, here's an example of, of adding callback with Social Miner. When the user says, okay, I want to call, I want to speak to an agent at this point, um, you can very easily then query UCCE, return with the expected wait time, show the customer, okay, it's about a four minute wait if you want to hold or a callback. Um, and if the user does want to call back, certainly you can add that to the queue and, and make the call back to the mobile device as well. So, uh, you know, whether it's on the website or a mobile device, you do, you do give the option of showing wait times and, and being able to offer the callback option as well. So with that, I'd actually like to switch over into a demonstration just to show you really the, the, the meat of it. Um, you know, you, you, if, you, if you think, okay, there's some kind of applicability here, what does it take to get running? Um, and, and that's what I'll do. Now, I personally do not have a Cisco, um, you know, environment set up on my laptop, so I'm going to switch over here uh, to a browser with a video in it that I'm going to walk you through, and hopefully this will give you a great sense not just of how the product looks, but how you will configure Cisco Voice Portal and Visual IVR to work together. So I will go ahead and share this application. And what you're seeing now is the Cisco Unified Call Studio, which should look very familiar to you if you come from the, the Cisco world. 
Uh, and this is just a good, you know, it's, it's a representative of a banking IVR tree. Um, it's, it's fairly, I wouldn't say complicated, but it, it uses menus, it uses, you know, getting PIN codes um, and, and all those kind of things that you would expect. Likewise, um, it is using pre-recorded audio files, like you can see here, it's, a, it's using WAV files and the different nodes, and, and I'm going to show you how we handle all of those things to, to visualize your, your Cisco tree. So your Cisco IVR tree looks probably quite similar to that. Now, this is the Visual IVR launch pad. If you start Visual IVR, this is what you would see, um, including some samples to get you started pretty quickly. Now, this advanced sample is the same what I just showed you in Call Studio, the banking example. So I'm going to run that for you in a second so you can see what it looks like, and then I'm actually going to show you how you would do it from scratch on a brand new uh, Cisco IVR tree. So uh, if you look at the settings, the only critical part that you need here is the URL to the Cisco Voice Portal server. And I'll do a test just to make sure I can connect to it. Um, but that's all it is, right? So we're connecting to your Cisco Voice Portal uh, and we can read that VXML. So let's go ahead and run this just so you can get a sense of what it looks like. And um, I'm going to pause this here just to explain what you're seeing here because there's, there's a lot of information. Um, your customers will not see all of this. Uh, all your customer will see is what you see on the left-hand side of my screen here, about one-third of my screen, this gray area with the red box. Uh, it's kind of the form factor of a mobile device or, or a website pop-up. So you can, you can sort of picture what the visual IVR piece of this looks like to your customers. It says, welcome to our bank. Please enter your six-digit account number. Um, what you see here on the right-hand side is only for you as a developer or, or IVR manager. If, if you're working with the IVR and visual IVR, this is kind of information to help you get started. So your customers will never see this. Uh, it's purely to explain what's happening as we go along. So as a customer here, I've got my visual IVR session. Again, that will be on my mobile device or, or on, on the website. So I can enter my six-digit account number. I can click Next. Uh, and then the next screen will load up. Please enter your four-digit security code. Let me pause there for a second. You can see here under the Cisco element, it's showing you which node in that Cisco interaction is actually being executed at this moment. Uh, and this is clearly the get pin code part of that interaction. Um, and the voice IVR prompt here, you can see it's playing a WAV file. Please enter your four-digit security code. Visually, it looks like this, where we ask the customer to please enter your four-digit security code. So. We'll let the customer go ahead and enter their four-digit security code and click Next. Uh, and here's a good example of a menu. You can, you can almost uh, imagine, if you will, what a voice IVR would sound like here. You know, to check your balance, press 1. To transfer money, press 2. For other options, press 3. This is how a menu is rendered on a visual IVR session. So it's that very same menu that your voice customers get, but now you have it on a visual device where, again, you can touch your way through these menu options. Um, and, and, and you can present these options or menus in different ways, and I'll show you some other examples of how that's done. Uh, let me go ahead and select Other, and here's another menu, a nested menu. Um, and I'm going to do one that's just a little bit breaking the mold from a true traditional voice IVR. Here's an example of how I've extended your voice IVR by using new capabilities on the visual channel. An example is collecting the customer's address. You wouldn't try this on a DTMF 1 through 9, but certainly if you have a keyboard and a visual interface, this is not a problem to actually accept or ask for a new address. So here we'll type a new address, um, and then we will be able to display it or, or provide a confirmation. Your new address is Atlanta, Georgia 30328. Now, none of that is actually breaking what you're doing today in your voice IVR. Uh, and in fact, it's all done within the Unified Call Studio. So, so it's not a different design tool. Um, we just allow you to utilize, here's that same new address. And, and you'll see here, I'm just using the variable that was captured. If you look at this audio group, um, your new address is, and it's just kept taking that variable value of what was entered in the previous node. So it's reusing everything within your Cisco environment uh, you know, you've already got a really a state-of-the-art IVR tool here. You know, you don't need to use a new one. Uh, so you stay within the tool you're used to. Uh, another example, you know, for example, um, let's see this. If you look at view my last six statements. Now, this is another a, a good example of showing an alternate way of providing a menu. 
this is a little problematic in a voice IVR. You can imagine if you're displaying, you know, which statement do you want to see? Push one for March, two for April, three for May, four for June, etc. Kind of tricky. Um, it's it, it, it's a little easier on visual. Certainly possible on voice, and I've, I've encountered those on voice. But you can see what the visual representation of that looks like, where it's actually a drop-down box where you can select the, the appropriate month that you want to see the statement for versus having to you know, listen to all those audio prompts. My apologies about the misspelling of August, which I blame on the developer. Uh, so we choose August and we choose next. And here again is something which you can show visually a lot easier than reading back in a voice session. Uh, you can certainly apply HTML and, and CSS style sheets to make this look a little better. Um, I've just kind of done a rudimentary version here. Um, just showing you that you can enrich the visual channel a little bit over the voice channel. But again, completely optional. Uh, certainly you can start with just a one-for-one -one mapping with your Cisco voice IVR and then slowly add some additional visual-only capabilities if it makes sense to, to your organization, uh, such as displaying tabular data here, which, which certainly is a little easier in, in that kind of session. Um, click next, and uh, let's look at one more example. For example, this, uh, you know, if we uh, transfer money, um, if, we, if, you, if you're working with, with money or currency in a, in a voice IVR, you typically have to use a 123 asterisks for the decimal point and then end with a pound. A little confusing. Uh, you know, it's certainly easy if you have a full keyboard to just enter 123.21 uh, and move on like that, and then you know you can show the confirmation of what was entered in the previous screen. And again, if I go to that node in the call studio, um, which was the transfer and get amount and confirm, you can see there's nothing, there's no extensions here. We haven't broken anything in call studio. We're just using the same constructs that you're familiar with within your call studio to, to provide that capability, which is, again, optional. So you know that's generally what it would look like to your customers, what you saw a visual IVR session. And at the end of this uh, webinar, I'm actually going to send you a link which will allow you to, dem to, to experience it as a customer so you can use your mobile device and try it out for yourself uh, and, and see what the consumer experience is like. But what I'd like to do now is kind of shift this around a little bit and just say, OK, you know, you just saw a running example of, of a visual IVR session. Now, let's say that you downloaded visual IVR and you wanted to do it yourself on your Cisco implementation, what does it take? What would you need to do to visualize your voice IVR today? Uh, so what we'll do is I'm just going to grab the URL here for the uh, voice server, um, which is your, your Cisco URL voice server. Um, and we'll create a new project, and we'll give it a name. And now I'll provide that URL to the, to the Cisco voice portal server and just test the connection. Uh, and we choose a window title, which is, is displayed to your customers. Let me just quickly pause. Uh, you notice this uh, checkbox, display unmatched audio. The reason this is important, if you, if you recall this, the script that I showed you, this banking example, it was using pre-recorded WAV files or audio files. Um, and, and that's what I want to show you. How do we handle those pre-recorded audio files? So. Let's go ahead, we'll save this, and we'll go into the edit mode, and we'll start visualizing a brand new implementation of, of, of a voice interaction. So when we click the button, you have a similar screen to what you saw before with some significant differences. So I'll explain what happened. Again, on the left-hand side, you're seeing the visual session, exactly what a consumer would see. Um, but you notice this comment here. It says, please provide annotations for the untranslated prompts. So what's happened? is we successfully connected to your Cisco voice portal, and we hit that first node in your IVR tree. Uh, and we wanted to display a visual version of it, but you are using two WAV files in there, um, or MP4 files, or whatever file format you're using. And we can't just magically introspect the sound file and pull out the text. So it is saying there are two untranslated audio files in this first prompt. So all you have to do. And this is just a one-time exercise. It takes you know, maybe a few hours for a large tree. You just click it, and you'll see it'll play it up here. It's playing welcome to our bank.wave. So all you need to do is just provide the textual representation of that audio prompt. And again, this is only if you use pre-recorded audio files. If you use text-to-speech, it's even easier. So we've done the one, and now I'll click the second one. It's the please enter six-digit account number WAV file. 
So let's provide the corresponding textual equivalent of that. Please enter six-digit account number. And then we can uh, finish the annotation. And I'll explain those annotations in a bit. We'll hit Save. Now when I click Next, it's going to try and rerun it. Um, and look at that. You've got that first node of your IVR is now fully translated. Um, welcome to our bank. Please enter your account number. And it starts looking like what I showed you earlier. So you really step through it node by node. I can type in an account number to test it. It'll hit your IVR. It'll come back with the next appropriate prompt, um, which is also now telling us, okay, this one, we also have an untranslated audio file. This is please enter your four-digit security code. So we'll provide the text version of that. Please enter your four-digit security code. And I want to just show you, you know, one of the optional markup tags. I'm going to use uh, password input here um, just to distinguish it from regular input. So now when I click Next, we'll try and rerun it. That's asking us, you know, please enter your PIN. And I type, you know, one, two, three, four, but you can see it's masked so that it's not displayed visually to people. And in that manner, you just quickly step through your IVR and you provide these translations. Um, and, and really what's key to point out, of course, is these translations, it's, it's a one-time exercise. We're reusing your back-end logic, your back-end integration, pulling data into your IVR, all your, you know, if-then health statements, your flows, everything stays the same. It's just really an exercise of providing a mapping for these WAV files should you be using pre-recorded prompts. Um, but on, it, it doesn't take more than a few hours to, to just run through your IVR tree and get those things mapped. So in that manner, you just step through your tree. You make sure they're all mapped. Once you've done, all that you need to do to make it available to your customers is really provide a URL string. The output of a visual IVR is just a URL um, really as any other web resources. So you can put it on your website. You can ha access it from a mobile device um, or using an SDK. You can even embed it in, in, into, into a, uh, a, a mobile app, a native mobile app. Um, so, so I hope certainly that that gave you a sense not only of how it looks like from a customer's perspective, but really how trivial it is. You know, with the tight integration to Cisco, it, it makes us very easy to quickly put that visual interface on your Cisco IVR, and then you can test your customer adoption, see how they like it, and if it's going well, certainly you can extend it. And for example, we do provide an interaction designer where you can start extending these flows on the visual-only channel. Um, and an example might be when you want to leverage the capabilities of the device. Uh, for example, it's kind of a classic you know, use case. As an insurance company, I might want to allow my customers to take pictures at the scene of the accident so they can upload those images to the agent as well. I'm, I'm leveraging new capabilities in the device or the GPS location of the device, et cetera. So certainly there is a designer if you want to do that. Uh, but by all means, I think the pragmatic approach quite often is start with visualizing your Cisco IVR, uh, make it available to your customers, test the adoption, and then slowly expand it out to use additional capabilities within that sort of visual uh, session. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, it certainly it, it works with your existing IVR platform, um, tight integration with Cisco, so very quick to get up and running. Uh, you can download the product, and if you have the, you know, connection string to the Cisco voice portal, uh, certainly you can get started with that. Uh, and it supports multiple platforms. You know, it, it, you can reach your – ultimately, this is only going to be successful if your customers can access it. Um, and so we, we make sure, you know, whether it's Android, iOS, um, you know, uh, even a BlackBerry, I dare say, um, uh, or, or a website. You know, it's available to, to your customers no matter where, where they may be. Uh, and, and providing call intercept, so you know, a, a big ROI component about this is if you can reduce the inbound call volume altogether and give, you know, make sure you get this in front of your customers. An example is that you know, instead of having a 1-800 number on your website, make that a live link to your IVR um, or make the first voice prompt on your IVR say something like, you know, to experience lower wait times uh, and our new visual IVR, please push 1. And you can send a text message with a link to that you know, visual session and let the customer start engaging that IVR visually right there and then. 
I, I mentioned the rich screen pop. You know, again, if you're using, if you if you if you've got the Cisco environment, you already have screen pop. Um, you know, perhaps using finesse uh, as the desktop. Regardless, uh, you know, we can tie into that, or you can supplement that with additional data. So if you want to be able to see the alphanumeric data entered or get photographs of the of the you know from the from the user's mobile device, etc., you can certainly do that. But um, have, let, letting the agent understand what you've done in that visual session is really key to reducing the handle time on the call. In, in the example I showed you earlier was collecting the service tag ID at the bottom of your laptop. Um, you know, by doing that before the voice call is connected and showing it to the agent, I prevent the agent from having to ask you again. Uh, and, and you know, clearly it's going to shorten the call. And in fact, uh, you know, our internal results are showing 30 to 60 seconds improvement in average handle time, which is a tremendous ROI behind doing that. I mentioned the designer, you know, honestly it's a phase two kind of thought. If you're happy with your visual flows from your existing Cisco voice IVR, you can start extending it. Um, and then really capturing the customer intent. And, and this is an exciting space generally. But if you cast your mind back, you know, right up to that first slide where I talked about 60% of customers coming in on self-service, um, you know, and, and when they abandon it and they start the call cold in the, in, in the IVR, what we're saying about capturing the customer intent is let's look at what you were doing on the website prior to connecting to that agent. So we have a better understanding of what you're doing. We can understand that you were, for example, struggling with a bill payment issue, um, and we don't really need to be wasting your time with a, with a troubleshooting issue. So uh, really starting to understand the customer intent and being able to, to more accurately route calls and give the agent uh, a, a warm handover of the call versus this kind of cold transfer. I won't go through all the benefits. You know, it's just something I like to point out is quite often you're choosing a technology either to benefit your customer or to benefit your business. And in this case, it's one of those rare ones where I think it's a win-win for both. Um, clearly on the customer side, you know, we, we, we spoke at length about how customers prefer touch and visual, et cetera. It, it is a better customer experience um, and, and, and less customer frustration. But from a business perspective, there's, there's clear ROI as it as well, lowering the handle time by providing that rich, scrub, uh, rich screen pop, um, and, and the fact that it's a quick and easy implementation. You know, we're not saying, okay, great, now you've got to throw away your entire investment um, and, and start over. We, we're saying, take that, that Cisco investment, which is working so well for you, and, and let's just project it onto a few additional channels, and do so in a couple of hours, days, you know, in, in a short time frame, so you can test the adoption. So, you know, if, if you look at where to go to from here, um, I think, uh, you know, if you visit visual-ivr.com, there's a, there's a demo link on the top right where you can actually try the demo. You can dial a number and experience it exactly as a consumer might experience a visual IVR, uh, which is certainly a good next step. Um, also, if you want to, you know, visualize your Cisco IVR, by all means, there's a, there's a download option there on the site as well where you can download the product um, if you're more technical in nature and connect to your Cisco voice portal and, and try it out for yourself as well. So um, with that, I would like to turn this back to Lee so we can have some time for questions and answers. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris, for your valuable insights on Visual IVR. Um, due to the high participation in this webinar, we will answer as many questions as possible from the Q&A window. So thank you all who have already uh, added questions to the Q&A window. Uh, those that we cannot respond to uh, in our allotted time, we will definitely respond back to you individually after the event via email. So now we'll uh, address a few questions in the Q&A window that have already been added. Uh, Chris, uh, you can see them as well. So if there's any that you want to answer in addition to the ones that I select, uh, please feel free to interrupt. Uh, the first one that I'll read to you, Chris, Chris here, uh, let's see, it says, how do you typically put a business case behind something like this uh, to sell it internally? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. So it, it depends a little bit about the culture in your organization. Um, you know, there's the soft matrix and kind of the hard matrix. The soft matrix, you know, improving the customer experience, uh, less frustrated customers, et cetera. Um, hard to attach some numbers behind that, but the hard matrix certainly come down to Average handle time reduction. I mentioned, you know, we think 30 to 60 second savings of average handle time. Um, so definitely a big ROI behind that, as well as less internal transfers because you're having far fewer zero outs uh, as people are more apt to actually explore the IVR tree and, and choose the right option in the first place. So quite 
easy to make a business case. You, you typically see an ROI, you know, around six to nine months uh, behind a solution like this. Okay, excellent. Uh, the next question in the window is, uh, this person says uh, they may have missed this, but do you have do you have to have an app installed to use Visual Lab VR? Um, no, and um, I tried to address it. Um, it it's uh, you know what we're trying to do is just. Uh, make this as HTML. Uh, you know, as, as we say, if you have to force your customers to download an app in order to be able to talk to you, you've really lost them. Um, so, so that that's not how we expect it to work. Uh, so, as long as you have an HTML4 or HTML5 browser, which every smartphone has today, uh, you can certainly use this. That said, um, if you have an existing mobile app, you can certainly use an SDK and embed Visual IVR to kind of extend your app out a little bit further. Um, okay. We also have a question here. Um, just reading it out. It says, uh, "Can you please comment on who in in an organization should be responsible for designing, implementing, and managing new Visual IVR application use cases?" Um, and it's a kind of a deep question. It's a uh, lot's going to again depend on the kind of organization that you are. What we're seeing for a first phase is that typically the IVR group uh, will own and deploy that visual IVR solution because it really is an extension of, of their Cisco environment. Um, once you've done that, when you're talking about you know phase two or three and starting to enrich your visual IVR solutions, I think you know it really depends on the culture of the organization. We see sometimes it's the marketing side driving those new additional kind of visual IVR use cases. Sometimes it's customer care. Uh, which are trying to maybe reduce the number of inbound calls or improve the self-service aspect, um, and then sometimes it's directly within the IVR group themselves who are who are innovating new solutions within the organization. So it really is a mix. Okay, great. Uh, I have a question here. It says um, they ask, how do you put this in front of your customers to get them to adopt it? Yeah, adoption is always an interesting question. It is a new technology. Um, and that's why we always propose, you know, you start with a visual version of your IVR and you start testing adoption. In, in terms of putting it in front of your customers, um, there are multiple ways. You know, I showed you on the website. Instead of a 1-800 number on the website, you can certainly put a contact us link on the website. When you click that contact us link, it starts the visual IVR session. Um, what we've had a number of customers do is when you call in to the voice IVR, because you directly dial 1-800, you know, help me, uh, what the voice IVR does is actually offer you a visual session right in the beginning saying, you know, to experience lower wait times, uh, please push one for a new visual IVR. And when a customer pushes one, uh, we, we send them a link to a visual session. And what some of our customers are doing, when they do that, they actually keep the voice session open at the same time so that the customer does not feel abandoned. And, and their intent is to only do this while people are learning about visual IVR, keep both channels option to guide the person through audio prompts while they're being guided visually, um, and then as visual IVR becomes more mainstream, they expect to drop the voice part of that if the customer opts for a visual session uh, just to lower the cost of keeping that voice channel open. Okay, excellent. Well, to respect the time of our attendees, and let them get back to their busy days. We're going to have just one last question, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, the last question, actually, there's a couple that touch on this, Chris. Uh, it says, does this work on English only, or what about multiple languages? Uh, that's Yeah, uh, and I saw another one related here about uh, character sets, U UTF, et cetera. So um, all related. Yes, yeah, so multiple languages uh, are supported. Um, Unicode, it's not a problem. Uh, multiple character sets. Of course, if, if your IVR is you know got multiple WAV files pre-recorded in different languages, there there is a requirement to obviously translate each one of those WAV files, like you saw me to do today in English. You do it for the other languages, but certainly you can support multiple languages. Okay, well, excellent. Well, this concludes our webinar today on Visual IVR or Visualize Your Cisco IVR, Delight Your Mobile Customers. Thanks again to Chris Toy, our Director of Product Marketing. If there are any other questions that we were unable to answer during today's session, we will definitely respond directly to you after the, after the event. 
We hope that you have gained valuable insight into Visual IVR and how easily you can utilize it to enhance your organization's customer service. A replay of the event will be available soon on Jakarta.com. And if you'd like a copy of the slides immediately, please contact me directly at ljudge at Jakarta.com. Once again, thank you for attending today. Please visit visualivr.com, excuse me, that's visual-ivr.com, as well as jakarta.com, and have a wonderful day. Thank you.